Hello darlings, and welcome back to Nerd Doc. In this video, we're going to explain the ending of Don't Worry Darling, as well as some of the important plot details. There will be spoilers for Don't Worry Darling in this video. This is your spoiler warning. There are also chapter timestamps if you'd like to jump around the video, and be sure to leave a comment below if you have any questions about our explanations or thoughts of your own. Don't Worry Darling uses a common movie trope where most of the film seems to be one thing, then there's a twist that completely changes everything you've been watching up until that point. This is similar in theory to movies like The Matrix or The Sixth Sense. With Don't Worry Darling, the film makes you think it's taking place sometime in the 1950s, centered around the Victory Project out in the desert in California. It's the brainchild of a doctor who goes by Frank in the film, as well as his partner, Dr. Collins. Victory seems like a utopian community, with the men going to work every morning, while the women cook, clean, hang out by the pool, and go shopping. The one rule in the Victory community is that no one is allowed to go near the Victory headquarters except Victory Project employees, namely the men. The Victory Project is actually a lie. In fact, everything in the movie is a lie. The main couple in the film are Alice Chambers and her husband Jack. Alice's friend and neighbor Margaret seemingly goes crazy after seeing a red plane in the sky that appeared to crash in the desert. When Margaret goes out to investigate with her young son, she saw something in the desert, but her son never made it back, and he has been missing ever since. The red plane seemed to crash near Victory headquarters, which means Margaret went to the one area she was not supposed to venture into. Margaret's husband tries to get her to take some pills to calm down, but she refuses. A few days later, Alice sees the same plane appearing to crash in the desert and ventures out toward Victory Headquarters, even going as far as to touch the building, causing her to black out and wake up in her own home with her husband acting as though nothing had happened. Shortly after, Alice sees Margaret on the roof of Margaret's house and watches Margaret slit her own throat, then fall to the ground. Some men come to take the body away, while other men grab Alice and remove her from the scene. Throughout the film, Alice hallucinates crazy or life-threatening situations such as the walls closing in on her, which is somewhat similar to what was happening to Margaret. Alice holds a dinner party where Frank reveals that he knows Alice went to Victory Headquarters, then challenges her to undermine him. Alice confronts Frank, but ends up looking crazy to the other dinner guests. Once everyone leaves, Alice seems to convince her husband Jack to leave the community, but instead, he arranges to have her taken away by the same type of people that took Margaret's body away. Alice is given shock therapy treatment and seems to return home with memory issues, but generally back to normal. It's at this point near the end of the film that the twist is finally revealed. None of these people are living in the California desert. In reality, this is all taking place in cyberspace, so to speak. It's a virtual reality world, similar in nature to the virtual world of The Matrix. But let's take a step back to explain this all from the beginning. In the real world, it's modern times. Jack and Alice are married and live together in a small apartment. Alice is a doctor who was referred to as Dr. Warren, meaning their last name isn't actually Chambers. Jack lost his job and basically sits at home listening to podcasts and conspiracy theorists. Their relationship is beginning to deteriorate because they can't afford a nice place to live and their current apartment is so run down it doesn't even have hot water at times. Alice is clearly not happy with her life and Jack is just leeching off of Alice at this point in time. Jack isn't a bad guy, but he's lazy and doesn't want to put in the work to find a job or even improve his marriage. Jack can't even be bothered to shave. Enter Frank's podcast about victory a virtual world in which everything is perfect, at least for the men. If you join Frank's Victory program, you go back to the 1950s when men ruled the world and women quote-unquote knew their place. Once Jack has made up his mind to follow Frank into the virtual world of Victory, he drugs Alice and places her in a medically induced coma-like state. Jack attaches Alice to a virtual reality device with her eyelids wired open and an IV in her arm to provide nutrients and keep her alive. Alice sees a number of visualizations as she enters the VR realm. This is to put her in a hemispheric synchronization, which is similar to hypnosis, but essentially allows the brain to enter a very deep sleep and enhances lucid dreaming. This is required to make Alice think the virtual world is actually real. Alice sees these images periodically throughout the movie as her brain tries to make sense of what's going on in the real world. 
This is also potentially what happens with the red plane that both Alice and Margaret see. It's not 100% clear exactly what the plane represents, but we have a few theories. During medically induced comas, the brain will cause people to dream about things that are happening around them in the real world. For instance, one case study saw that a person dreamed about Alaska despite never having been to or even having a desire to travel there. The reason for this is because the doctors in the real world were giving her ice packs to bring down a fever. This person's brain translated the cold from the ice packs into her being in Alaska. Something similar could be happening with Alice and Margaret and the Red Plane, as well as the various hallucinations they suffered. When it comes to the Red Plane specifically, their brains could be subconsciously leading them to the exit, or it's simply a plane flying overhead in the real world and their brains are visualizing that in their lucid dream state, or what we think is potentially the most likely reasoning behind the plane is that Shelley, Frank's wife, is the culprit. It's possible Shelley has programmed the plane to lead these women out of the program, effectively freeing them from this virtual prison. But more on Shelley in a moment. The synchronistic nature of the ballet class all the women attended and the imagery Alice kept seeing are all meant to keep her in this hemispheric synchronization state to keep the women thinking the simulation is real. When Alice started to challenge Frank, he egged her on because this was a test for his hemispheric synchronization algorithm to see if she could break out of the hypnosis and get back to the real world. When she failed to do so and just pointed out surface level flaws, Frank was disappointed. Most of the women in the simulation are there against their will, like Alice. They can also be programmed or forced to act a certain way or have specific desires. This is evidenced by Alice's overly heightened sex drive, but this also provides insight into Jack's general lack of manhood. Throughout the movie, Alice and Jack never have direct intercourse. It's always Jack pleasuring Alice because he doesn't feel as though he can adequately satisfy her in any other way. This may be partially due to the fact that Jack doesn't want to have to clean up his own mess every morning when he exits the simulation, and because deep down he feels bad for what he's done to Alice, so he subconsciously wants to make it up by servicing her while denying himself from the same pleasures. Now, of the women in the Victory program, only Bunny and Shelley are aware of the simulation. Shelley is married to Frank and was probably his first test subject and not a prisoner in the space. But over the years, she's grown tired of Frank, and when Alice finally breaks the mold, Shelley takes the opportunity to kill Frank and take over the victory program for herself, likely making it more focused on the women instead of the men. It's also possible she's been planning Frank's death for some time, just waiting for the right opportunity to kill him and stop this slave-like community and take over the victory project for herself. Meanwhile, Bunny is in the program voluntarily because she lost her children in the real world, Bunny couldn't get them back, and she can't deal with the grief of losing them, so she chooses to stay in the simulation where she can be with her children once again. None of the children in the simulation are real, which is also why Margaret's child was taken away from her when she discovered Victory Headquarters. Since Margaret's child never actually existed, he was simply removed or erased from the program as a way to punish Margaret for breaking the one rule of the Victory community, not going near Victory Headquarters. Speaking of Victory Headquarters, it basically serves as a way to exit the program. It triggers a response that wakes the individual up in the real world and allows them to go on about their daily lives. For the men, all they have to do is drive to a specific location in the desert. In the simulation, the women are never taught how to drive, and are even programmed to forget how to drive, specifically to avoid the possibility that they may try to escape. However, they can still escape by simply touching the exterior of the Victory Headquarters building, which is also why they are prohibited from getting anywhere near it. When the men leave every morning for work, they're actually exiting the program and going back to the real world. Jack goes to work during this time because he needs to make enough money to keep him and Alice in the Victory program. There isn't a large fee to be involved, probably because this is still in the testing phases, but it's likely a monthly fee of at least $100 per person and probably no more than $1,000 per person. We actually know this because Jack is lazy and almost certainly wouldn't be able to get a job that pays a lot of money. Jack just needs to make enough money for the rent, utilities, and the victory program entry. Jack placed Alice in this world because he thought it would be a shortcut to their happiness. 
Alice wasn't pleased with her life, especially when it came to Jack, but she still enjoyed her work as a doctor, and more importantly, her freedom of choice. In the Victory program, Alice loses that freedom, which is why she flips out when she finally figures out what's going on. Alice is able to snap out of the hemispheric synchronization when she hears a specific song. This is actually very similar to Stranger Things Season 4 and how those characters snap out of the hypnosis from the primary antagonist by listening to their favorite song. For Alice, it's a song that she has fond memories of because it reminds her of a time when her and Jack were happy together. Throughout the movie, she flashes back to a point in time when Jack had just lost his job, but the couple was still happy. At the time, they thought they would figure things out, but unfortunately they ended up growing apart, partially due to Alice working longer shifts at the hospital, and partially because Jack wasn't willing to put in the effort to properly mend the relationship. Alice kills Jack in the virtual world, which also kills him in the real world. This concept is very similar to the Matrix in that because the world is so realistic, it tricks the brain into thinking it's real. So if you die or get injured in the simulation, your brain thinks that you've really died or been injured and ceases to function. This stems from a deep-rooted psychosocial conditioning or psychosomatic association of the people in the Victory program, which is difficult to override, especially for the women who never get to leave the program. As you can see, there's a lot to deconstruct in Don't Worry Darling, but hopefully you have a better understanding of the movie and the real-world concepts the movie is based on. So what did you think of the film? Did it feel too much like The Matrix, or did you enjoy it completely? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and of course if you have any additional questions, feel free to ask them in the comments as well. For now, that wraps up this video. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with someone who loves Florence Pugh and Harry Styles.